Welcome everyone to the June 2021 Buff meeting. I'm Natalie Merline. I'm a TerraCorps member at Speak for the Trees. And so I, that's a branch of AmeriCorps and I've been serving at Speak for the Trees for the past year as a community engagement and youth education coordinator. And so um, coordinating Buff and facilitating these meetings is one of my projects. So, I'm going to start with sharing the agenda for today. So we'll start with community updates like we usually do. We have um, a few updates from our end. And then I am going to hand it over to Heidi, who's here to talk about some tree removals that happened at McConnell Park in Dorchester. And uh, Josie is here from Conservation Law Foundation to talk about some bus idling cases in Boston and how you all can be involved and maybe help with those cases. And then the bulk of our meeting will be with Dr. Nina Estrella Luna to talk about equity in the urban forest plan and how uh, members of the community and you all can be in involved in that. And then if we have time towards the end, um, we might start a discussion on writing a letter to the mayoral candidates on urban forestry um, and if not, we can always uh, push that to July, and that's when our next meeting will be, which is July 9th. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and get started with a few updates from our end. And so um, there's a couple of events coming up. One is a couple months ago at Maryland, if you all remember, Marilyn Ray Smith spoke about a new municipal reforestation bill uh, in Massachusetts. And there's going to be upcoming a informational event on that bill for community groups, nonprofits and residents to just learn about what the bill means. And so that's scheduled right now for June 22nd, but I know we're pushing it back a little bit. So when I have an update on that date, I will let you all know. And then the second thing is there is a mayoral candidates forum um, hosted by the Boston Park Advocates coming up on July 29th, which is a Tuesday from 6 to 7.30 p.m. I'll throw that link in the chat so you all can learn more about the event. There's not yet a registration page, but that should be coming soon. Right now, there is a, a link for organizations to co-sponsor the event and sign on. And so your organization can do that right now. And before I move on, we were asked to sign on as a co-sponsor as the Boston Urban Forest Friends. So I wanted to ask you all if anyone had any strong opinions for or against before I filled that out. Sarah, I see your thumbs up. Oh, Marilyn, I see yours too. <laughs> yes, it seems like the kind of thing that um, we should add our voice to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was assured there'd be at least one question on urban forestry, but all of them will be around green space and trees in general. So, okay, I'll fill that out so that we are a co-sponsor for that mayoral forum. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Heidi, who's here to talk about, does Marilyn have a question? Oh, you're muted. I went to the mayoral forum the last time around and everybody made all these great promises about expanding the parks and one everybody within a five or 10 minute walk or 1% of the budget. And I'm not sure that it really came true. So I just think people should keep pushing. Yeah. And remind people that some of the promises were made didn't happen. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Marilyn. So now I'll hand it off to Heidi to talk about uh, the trees at McConnell Park in Dorchester. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thanks for having me and here to talk about the project. Um, so the McConnell Park project um, got underway uh, just recently, the work started. Um, but the last community meeting that we had with them was in October of 2018. And since then, it looks like some of the plans have changed and there was no community meeting since then. On May 28th, they removed 32 
mature trees from McConnell Park. On June 1st, they had a community meeting about it. So I was not happy that they had the meeting after all the trees were already removed and there's nothing we can do about it. The reason they had to remove the trees was because they are raising the whole park by three and a half feet. However, they removed trees on the edge of the park as well, which I believe did not need to be removed. They also removed a very large sycamore tree, which is on the edge of the, of the park. It was a group of six sycamore trees. And when I heard that they were going to be removing trees, I said, you're not taking down those sycamores, right? And she said that the, the project manager in the parks department confirmed that they would not be taking those down. However, a neighbor called me and said, they're taking them down. So I ran down there and talked to the project manager who was on the site and said, and one of the trees was already down and he said it was a mistake. Jesus Christ. And then I contacted the project manager that I had been emailing and she said that she apologized. It was not a mistake that it was planned to come down. And I just didn't understand why, because it was directly in line with the other copes of the sycamore trees there. So I was not happy about that. Um, but anyway, just another update about that project is that they are planning on planting 56 trees. So it's a nice number of trees, but it does not replace, as you all know, mature trees. Um, and they, are also, they also gave the number of, that they're gonna be planting three and a half caliber trees, which to my understanding is pretty small. I don't know if maybe you guys have a better understanding of the size of the trees, but I thought that, that sounded small to me. Um, when I inquired about nature spaces in the park, well, you know, like plantings, like flowers and whatnot, they didn't really have an answer. They said that there was some nature space planned for the drainage areas in the ball field. So for those of you not familiar with McConnell Park, it comprised of baseball field, playground, and then uh, green space, passive areas. Um, when I inquired about maintenance and watering, they said that the contractor is in charge while on site, but gave no information on what happens after. So I'm not confident that the parks department will uh, maintain the trees that are planted. And basically the city doesn't have a good track record of keeping young trees alive. But that's my update. I'd be happy to take any questions about the project. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for sharing. And it's sad to hear, you know, these updates. I feel like usually they're happening every month. And I mean, more often than that, but at our meetings every month. And that Boston Urban Forest Friends is here to support any efforts um, that you have going on and support in any way that we can. Thank you. Sarah? Hi, sorry, it takes me a minute to unmute. Um, I was wondering how they came up with the number 56, because in my head, if 32 came down, a two to one replacement might be a nice target for the replacements. That's and a good close. Idea. Yeah, I don't know how they came up with the number, but I like your thinking about it and maybe I'm highly involved with our civic association here, so maybe we could put in an ask for that. Marilyn? This is just another issue to raise at the mayor uh, hearing, because this is an election year, and the city needs to be accountable for doing this kind of stuff. And, and the idea of telling people after the trees are all cut down and cutting down trees by mistake and, and saying we're not cutting trees down and doing it. I mean, that's just outrageous. It's just totally unacceptable. And people need to hear that voters are really angry about that. 
and because that that message will resonate. People stopped the cutting down of trees in Melanie and Cass because they got there before they had a chance to cut them down. If they had been there a week a week later, those trees would have all been gone. And so they knew that. So they just moved in the dark and then said, oh, so sorry, gee, we forgot to tell you. I mean, you just can't have that. You just can't. I mean, I don't live in the city of Boston, but you guys do. And you just need to be outraged. It's just not acceptable. Meanwhile, everyone's touting their big urban forest program. Come on. Sorry. I totally agree, Marilyn. And at none of none of the community meetings that they talk about the trees and then then suddenly, you know, we understand a few had to come down because they're raising the park, but what they did was totally unacceptable, especially having the no community meeting like recently and then just cutting down all those trees. Um, yeah, thank you. They knew that if you knew about it, you would stop it. Right. That's why they didn't tell you. This is not an accident. Don't think this was some kind of mistake. I used to work in government. They know exactly what they were doing. Molly, I saw your hand was up. Did you have something to ask or say? Yeah, just a comment. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that this happened. So I'm Molly with DCR Urban and Community Forestry. Um, but I just wanted to comment on the size of the replacement. And obviously, you know, tree that's planted is going to replace certainly not right away what was removed um, but three and a half inch caliper is is probably pretty average for what um, municipalities like boston would plant for this kind of project if you get much larger than that it can be harder for the trees to establish and survive um, so at least that sounds you know the size sounds pretty reasonable from a just you know, arboricultural perspective. Um, Thank you for that information. I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, real quick, we'll just take one last thing from Liz and then we'll move on to the next person. Liz? Oh, you're muted. Liz, you're muted. Liz, can you hear me? There you go. I have the same problem. Yeah. <laughs> we did not have advance notice. And in fact, the butters didn't get notice even of the planning process. So it's really, it's a very screwed up process for this park. Um, and there were two of us prepared to strap ourselves to the tree, but it had already been cut down the 100 year sycamore. Um, I really think we need to take some fairly vocal action. Um, the Civic Association, I'm not sure where they stand on this. Um, it used to, and the people who have been here for a long time know that years ago, this would not have happened because the Civic Association, A, would have been on top of it. And if they had come in here, they would have been down on mass to stop it until they went through the process properly. But since it's all done, what do we do now? I think they really need pressure for planting more trees and maintaining more trees. They can do it if they choose to do it. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much for sharing. And I saw in the chat, Dorothy mentioned, uh, it's worth pressing the numerous candidates for city council on this issue as well, not just the mayoral candidates. So that's a really good point. So thank you, Heidi, for sharing. And like I said, we are here to support in your efforts. And um, with that, I'm going to hand it off now to Josie, who's here to, from Conservation Law Foundation to talk about some bus idling um, cases. Thank you, Natalie. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Josie and I'm with the Conservation Law Foundation's Clean Air and Water Program. I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to talk about a few ongoing air pollution cases that we're working on and how members of the community can get involved. Uh, so CLF is currently in the middle of a few Clean Air Act air pollution cases against bus companies that have been violating anti-idling laws. And a big part of these cases is that if they end in settlement, which they usually do, the polluters have to fund supplemental environmental projects that are carried out by local nonprofits um, and aim to fix the problem that the polluter was creating. So in these idling cases, those projects can be things like tree planting and discounted tea passes. And just as an example, Speak for the Trees actually received some of the funds from a, formal set, uh, a former settlement back in, I think, January. So as for how community members uh, can get involved, in order to bring these cases and establish legal standing, we need to find 
local residents who would like to participate as standing witnesses, which are basically just people who live or spend time in the affected areas and agree that the pollution should stop. The main responsibility of a standing witness is to speak with a member of our team about the time that you spend in the neighborhood where the pollution is happening and your general thoughts on air pollution. And then there's a slim chance of having to speak with the opposing counsel in the case about the same topics. Um, but overall, no special expertise is required. The only real requirement is just wanting your community's air to be cleaner, which I'm sure applies to most or everyone in this group. And as for the actual locations involved in these particular cases, we're looking for people who spend time near the following places. The Boston University gym, the Wellington Orange Line Station in Medford, the Alewife Red Line Station in Cambridge, the Riverside Green Line Station in Newton, the Chelsea Silver Line Station, and the Encore Boston Harbor Casino in Everett. So if you spend time near any of these places and are interested in helping out, please send me a direct message in the chat or you can email me at janderson at clf.org and I can give you more information. And thank you so much everyone for listening and thank you Natalie for letting me make this announcement here. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming and we'll make sure to get your information out in the notes afterwards as well so that people can contact you to be involved. Great, thank you. Can I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to formally raise my hand on this thing. It's okay. Can I ask a question about this? Yep. Is there some reason why the Fairmount line is not included in this? Because it's right now diesel and, and pretty polluting. The Fairmount commuter rail line, which runs from all the way from Foxborough to South Station, but mostly through Dorchester, Hyde Park, Mattapan, and Dorchester. So this um, is against a specific company, but oh, okay. CLF is open to bringing new cases. So if there's another uh, polluter that you're interested in, you could definitely contact me about that as well. Okay, I think the, Fair the Fairmount Transit Coalition is working on that and I'll I'll see if they've, they've already, or if they can contact you if they haven't already. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Josie for joining us today. And with that, um, I'm going to transition it now to uh, the main, the bulk of our meeting, which is going to be a discussion and Q and A with Dr. Nina Estrella Luna, who's here as the equity consultant for the urban forest plan. And she'll be talking some more about equity and then also how you all and the community can be involved in the urban forest plan process and how there are different um, ways to be involved. And she'll, she'll break that down a little bit more. And so with that, I will hand it off to Nina. Thank you everyone. And I'm um, happy to be here today. I'm sorry I missed your last month's meeting. Um, we just couldn't, there's just so many meetings. There's so many meetings, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, um, so I am Dr. Nina Estrella Luna. I am a social equity, the, the social equity consultant for the urban forest plan process. Um, that's what I do. I used to be a university professor in, uh, as a political sociologist and law and policy scholar. Um, this is what I do now. <clears throat> and so I want to just give you a, uh, an orientation to how the structure of the engagement process is. Natalie, would I, would I be able to share my screen? Would you be able to uh, give me that? Yes, I will Great. do that. I probably should have told you that earlier. I apologize. No worries. You should be able to do it now. Okay, great. Uh, let's see this one. So, so here is the basic structure of how um, the engagement process is going to work. We we are doing things differently than the typical planning process. There's two very very different aspects to this uh, process than what we typically experience here in Boston. A lot of you are very familiar with this. We know that typically we have a community advisory board. They meet every once in a while. They say a bunch of things. The, the, the city does take whatever that, you know, whatever they get there and they do whatever they want with it. What we want to do differently this time is we wanted to restructure this because it was very important for um, the parks department to consider equity. Uh, they were very, very serious about that piece of it, that this be an equity centered plan. 
And the way that we're, te we're talking about equity, uh, and which I'll get to in a moment, um, is that we're focusing on our historically excluded communities uh, of Boston. So these are the communities that were redlined or reversed redlined in the Viberg era. These are our communities of color, our low-income communities, and our immigrant communities. And so the way that we structured the community advisory board is one piece of it is the interdepartmental working group. And we did that intentionally because we want uh, the city of Boston to see itself as part of the community, right? So we're sort of restructuring that piece of it. They are part of the community too. If you work for the city, most of the time you have to live in the city anyway. So you're part of the community as well. And then we have an equity council and the equity council is comprised of uh, residents or other uh, members who, ad who live in or advocate for our historically excluded communities. And you actually have two people here today who are on that council. Uh, and then we have the group that we're calling the collaborating partners. Now the equity council and the interdepartmental working group will be working very closely with each other throughout this process as we uh, center the needs, goals, and aspirations of historically excluded communities. And the collaborating partners is basically everyone else who has an interest and a passion for our open spaces and the trees in the city for whatever reason they have, right? Some folks are interested in the open space piece. Some folks are interested in the quality of life piece. Some folks are interested in the uh, environmental and climate change related aspects of it. So anybody, can be a part of the collaborating partners. Collaborating partners will be invited to all of the meetings that we will be having over the next uh, several months. Um, they will also be informed of all the activities, all the engagement activities, the surveys, those kinds of things that will be going out. Um, but they won't be working as closely with us. So they'll be collaborating, but they won't be at every single meeting that the IWG and the Equity Council will be at. Um, there will also be folks who we might reach out to for focus groups and things like that, depending on what kinds of questions and priorities get raised to the top in this process. Um, now, the reason why we have done it this way is that if we want, if we really want to take equity seriously, then we actually have to focus on redressing the historical exclusion and marginalization of our uh, residents of Boston. And we know um, some people here uh, are aware of the communities that have been neglected because of who lives there, uh, either the, the color of their skin, because of their immigrant status, or uh, the languages that they speak. And so in order to get at equity, and we need to actually structure things to actually create that as an outcome, right? And we also want to rebuild some trust, build and or rebuild um, trust and relationships between the city and communities that they have historically not listened to. Um, so that's essentially what that uh, structure is going to look like. So to get at the question that was asked about how can you be involved, you are all in, uh, invited to be members of the collaborating partners. You are all also <clears throat> uh, can always contact me, uh, Amy and Davi from Stoss, who are the one of the co-leads, uh, as well as um, Rachel and Jenny, who are the other co-leads from Urban Canopy Works, who I believe you heard from a couple of months ago, we are more than happy to come to the meetings, to uh, to your meetings, probably not every month because this is a very, this is a citywide plan. There's a lot of working pieces to it, um, but we are happy to come to your meetings to give you any updates uh, or to answer any questions that you might have on this. And again, you are, and I don't remember, I know Natalie, you said that you did have the link to apply to become a collaborating partner. Thank you very much. So feel free to go to that link and to share it uh, with other people in your community who may want to be um, involved in this process. So um, we will be sharing with you all, you know, when we do have different activities, uh, other engagement activities that we'll be doing so that there's always a, a, an opportunity to be in communication with us. Uh, and I do also want to mention as well that there are two members here or two people here whose names that I can see at least 
that uh, are members of the Equity Council, um, that they represent community, that they'll be part of um, representing communities who have been histor historically excluded from these processes. So I don't wanna take up a huge amount of time talking. Um, I'd rather open it up to uh, questions that you might have about that. Yeah, so if you have a question, if you could raise your Zoom, your little blue Zoom hand, that would be great because you'd go to the top of my screen. But if you can't figure that out, you can um, raise your actual hand and I'll try to find you or just throw your question in the chat also. Celeste. Excuse me. I was wondering what the timetable is for um, this. And also, I wanted to compliment you on showing slides that are readable on a Zoom screen and, and not too small that um, we have to have our nose on the screen and shut off the video in order to do it. <laughs> So on that last one, thank you, Celeste. On that last point, one of the benefits of working with a design firm is that you have people who know how to do things like that. So yes, I, and I totally agree with you, especially as somebody who used to teach online. Um, so the time frame is uh, the Equity Council will actually have their first meeting this month, and that's just a get to know, so the Equity Council members get to know each other. Uh, we wanna build relationships across the city, obviously, because as we all know, there's gonna be the work to create the plan, and then there's gonna be the work after to advocate for the policies and the budgets that are gonna be needed in order to implement the plan, right? Um, and so the first set of public workshops that we'll be having with the entire community advisory board, so Equity Council, Interdepartmental Working Group, and collab collaborating partners, that will happen at the end of July. Uh, so it'll be monthly meetings, monthly two-hour meetings, July, August, and September. And uh, Urban Canopy Works will be pulling us through a process where we will be learning about the trees uh, as part of the inventory that's happening right now. So some of you may know if you've been following, there's an inventory happening uh, across the city of the street trees, uh, in particular, so all the trees in the right-of-way. Mm -hmm. So... Um, as well as some other analysis that we're doing from a variety of different sources. So we'll be learning all about that. We'll be learning about, and this is, by the way, the other piece that's different. Um, we're not just looking at the trees themselves and how do we create uh, and, and build an urban canopy that's resilient and equitable, resilient for climate change in particular, and equitable. But we're also going to be looking at the policies and the practices in the city that might contribute to or detract from building a healthy, resilient, equitable urban canopy. And so some of the things that you mentioned that I made note of, you know, around things like, you know, the, the, the confusion about what trees are gonna be felled and the timing of things and who has oversight over what, like these are things that we wanna hear from people about. That's what will happen in those meetings. Um, and we will be investigating and Urban Canopy Works will actually be doing a lot of work on identifying what kinds of policies we probably either need to revive because as some of us know, if we've been here long enough, there's probably policy that the city forgot it had. There's authority that the city forgot it had that it just needs to revive or it needs to be revised or it needs to be created, right? And then which ones of those need to be an ordinance, which ones of those need to be, could just be policy and practice, right? So that will all happen through a series of conversations, interviews and focus groups, July, August, September, and then also into the fall as well. We'll be doing a variety of other engagement activities in the fall. The ideal is we hope to have a plan in the uh, early part of next year. So okay. January, February, March, that's sort of where we are hoping. Thank you, it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanna add that the link I sent is just to the general urban forest plan page. And that's where you can fill out an expression of interest to be a collaborating partner. And there's also um, 
different PDFs in different languages for what that what those roles are. And it, it uh, has in writing the dates and the, the time frame that Nina was speaking about. So it's written down there if you need to reference it again. I'll hand it off now to Sarah. Can I ask then, a oh, going to forward? Yeah, Pat, Can real quick, and then we'll, I'll move yeah, on to Sarah. Okay. I just wondered if, um, if in these discussions, um, whether it's in the various committees or in the community process, or where exactly, looking at the city policies, there'll be a discussion about what's happening in the city with development, because mm -hmm. that has an enormous impact on existing tree canopy and, and on planting new trees. And it's some, it seems as though they're being talked about, they're siloed, you know, we're talking about development over here and urban forest over here. So will they be kind of talked about together? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, we have on the interdepartmental working group, we have members of BPBA, uh, as well as uh, folks from DND who are, and ONS, who are going to be in, for the folks who are new to some of these acronyms, so BPDA, the Boston Planning uh, and Development Agency, used to be known as the BRA, uh, Boston Redevelopment Agency. DND is the Department of Neighborhood Development, which also has responsibilities for some of the, the smaller parcel developments that happen, uh, as well as off, uh, Office of Neighborhood Services. And though that's the office that is primarily responsible for doing that, that interacting with the community on the more day-to-day -day side. So they're the ones that when there's a development happening, for example, they're often involved in the sort of notification processes and things like that. Interesting to your point, in, one, in our first meeting with the Interdepartmental uh, Working Group, the IWG, we had uh, staff from the PDA who were very excited about this in, in large part because they feel at this moment that they, they would like more authority in order to protect the trees in these development processes. And so one of the things that gives me some cautious optimism about this process compared to a lot of our standard Boston planning processes is that there's a lot of folks who are now working for the city that do want to see change. Um, it, change is not easy in a city as old as ours and with the kind of culture that we have here, but there, this is an opportunity th to begin to build a different way of doing things, both from an equity perspective, as well as just from a general <laughs> doing things right perspective, so that we move away from the sort of path that history has put us on, right? And so hopefully we can build the relationships that we need to be built you know, across all the stakeholders so that after this plan is actually developed, those relationships can be there to push this forward. <coughs> Thank you, Pat. <laughs> so is it me now? Yeah, Sarah. Oh, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this isn't my question, but um, as a follow-up to Pat's, is the Boston Civic Design Commission part of the Environmental Working Group, BCDC? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Sometimes I have to think about that because we talk with the acronyms so often that we forget what their actual names are, right? Um, I have to go back and look. I'm, I'm not entirely sure um, they, that the, the, the processes, the decision-making processes that involve the BCDC, will definitely be incorporated into our policy analysis because that's just a part of the process. Mm -hmm. The landscape architects uh, in uh, a separate meeting that we had with them at BP, the BPDA landscape architects did mention the, some of the BCDC processes. I can't tell you for sure at the moment, I'd have to go back and look at the list, whether there's somebody there, but one of the, th so not all of the work is gonna happen in the CAB meetings, right? We will also be doing interviews. So when thing, questions like this come up about, oh, BCDC or um, the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, right? Like they have, I, I think we all can recognize the ZBA is another kind of elephant in the room. Um, and so 
there will be opportunities for us to, to kind of have those conversations with them so that we can make some of the recommendations that, are, that, that, that the city is hoping to have in order to move this forward. Thank you. And my question was um, on the uh, collaborating partners. Um, sorry, I haven't looked on the website yet. Is that kind of a express interest and we want as many as possible or is it a like a competitive, we'll pick 10 or something? Um, at this moment, we want everyone who is interested to express their interest. And I think what the, the way that we've moved, we're moving forward on this is we wanna see how many come in. Obviously, if we get 2000 people expressing interest, that's, a, that's too big of a group for, for us to have real meaningful conversations. Uh, and that's part of this process for those three workshops that we'll be having across the summer is that, you know, there, the intention is for there to be intimate conversations in breakout groups, right? And so 2000 may be too much. I will say we haven't settled on a, an actual number for the collaborating partners. Um, so what we would, what I would say to you is just, if you are interested, please apply, you know, and answer all the questions. And for those folks who are not, if it comes down to us saying, you know, we're sorry, there was a lot of applications, we had to pick a number and, and move forward, we will not ignore you, right? <laughs> right? We will have your contact information, you will be kept in the loop. Uh, if you're a social media person, please follow the Boston Parks Department on Twitter, um, because that, that will be another source of information going out. But obviously, you know, Natalie has my information, you and, and are the Stoss and Urban Canopy Works information. So even if you are not chosen, Sarah, for example, um, there'll be plenty of opportunity to be kept informed and to keep giving us feedback um, throughout the process. Thank you. Allison, I see that you're next. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nina, for um, this work you're doing. It's great. Um, so I have two questions, and one is um, from my role as a reporter, and the other is my own interest. But um, the Equity Council, and maybe I miss this, um, it's already been uh, constituted, you said. And so I'm wondering, um, what was the selection process? How were people chosen? And mm -hmm. um, um, is this, is it finished? Are all neighborhoods uh, represented that um, you wanted represented? So the process for selecting equity uh, council members involved, uh, it, it was in a large way kind of invite only in, in the sense that Everybody that that uh, is a part of it was either recommended to be a part of it because they are actively engaged, uh, either members of their community at the grassroots level or actively engaged in the neighborhood as a, as part of the, maybe their responsibilities working for an NDC or another community based organization. Um, we were targeting very specific communities, right? They're very specific geographic communities, very specific. Um, uh, identity communities. With that said, not every community um, decided that they wanted to participate. Um, there were communities who have, uh, I think, understandably very good reasons, historic reasons not to trust anything the city does. So even if they know me and I know them and we've worked together on other issues, the, they have no reason to trust the city. Right, and so in those cases, we'll be doing like we what like we're doing with you. We will meet them at their meetings, uh, and have separate conversations with them <clears throat> as as we go through the process, and and that's that's that that's how we're going to try to do it. This is as uh, you know, let's let's acknowledge that this is very different. This, the city typically does not take equity seriously in any way, shape, or form. Right, um, they want to now. We just have to figure out what are the best processes for doing that, right? And so a lot of this is experimental in the sense that how do we have processes that in start to include people who have been neglected and communities that have been neglected 
in order to redress that that legacy of the and the history of exclusion and neglect. So, so that's how that part happened. Um, I don't feel like I answered the entire question. Yeah, the um, well, I, I have a, a second related question, mm -hmm. but uh, with those communities that you wanted to include but uh, haven't yet, you know, participated or might not be participating. Um, just I'm w wondering too if um, all the selected people are residents of those neighborhoods rather than um, staff uh, from institutions or uh, you know organizations. I think mm -hmm. it's important to have a resident voice. Oh, absolutely. And I would say, to my knowledge, and and I, I haven't gone through everybody. You know, I have, we will be putting together a little survey so that we can get a sense of who's there. I would say I would 99% of everybody uh, lives in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, some some folks, especially some of our the folks who are representing NDCs or CDC or community based organizations, may live in different neighborhoods than the organization that they work for, uh, but they do live in Boston. And yeah. so uh, okay. I th they think that I could, and I say that just to say there's probably one or two people who are. Uh, you know, they, they, maybe they live in Cambridge or maybe they live in Somerville, but they work for and have worked for uh, a community-based organization in Boston for a long time. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. That, uh, but related to that, some of the distrust happens because those are the folks that the city usually does select for these types of um, mm -hmm. committees and just... Yeah where yeah. you, you will see residents um, uh, not, not engaged. Um, my second question mm -hmm. is um, just when will the names of um, all the people involved, both in the equity and the intergovernmental um, group be shared uh, publicly? That's a very good question. And I don't think we've made a decision on that. So let me note that down. And when we have our team, our next team meeting, I'll bring that up. Uh, okay. that, you know, at what point will we do that? I don't think, I, I will say for the equity council members, we may not be releasing their names until after the first meeting, mainly because there's some folks who said, I'm interested, I would like to be involved, but I wanna to come to the first meeting just to make sure. And so we wanna give them the opportunity to actually make an affirmative choice um but i will make that note thank you okay. i don't think i see any other questions in the chat but i still wanted to keep the floor open if someone else had a question Or a comment. You can yell at me too. Yeah. I'm used to it. I used to be a university professor, and I it just goes all the way over me. I'm I'm happy mm -hmm. to keep going. If, if Natalie, just with one more, uh, just go for it. Um, I'm assuming elected officials are not involved in any of these. Um, three groups, is that correct? That would be correct. And it's interesting that you say that because when we think about um, what's going to need to happen on the other end of this project, right? That the advocacy that's going to be needed and that kind of thing. It has come to my attention recently. Um, and I, you know, some, not everyone here knows who I am, but I've been very politically involved in Boston too for quite a long time. Uh, I'm a, I live in East Boston. So and as you might imagine, we have our own similar issues to some of the things that you all were describing. Um, <clears throat> At some point, we will probably have to think about how to make sure that at least elected officials are in, uh, aware of what's going on. Um, I, I will be transparent that a couple of elected, the people who, uh, you know, the staff members of certain elected officials have reached out to me because they know me and we might work together in other initiatives um, just to say, hey, we're interested um, and I make it very clear, like, yeah, you're not necessarily eligible to be on an equity council or even uh, necessarily collaborating partner. But again, we do want to make sure that people are aware. So we're, we're in the moment, we're sort of beginning the process of thinking about that, about how to integrate that into the engagement, precisely because at some point, right, elected officials have to do their job. 
right? They have to pass policy, they have to pass ordinances, they have to do their accountability. Very happy to see that some of the open space advocates are gonna have a very specific mayoral forum on these issues, right? And those are, the, those are the opportunities for you as members, you know, as residents, people who care about these things, that's where you can do also your form of advocacy as well. But they're not, you're, you're absolutely right, they're not, uh, no elected officials or candidates to our knowledge, candidates for office are um, members of this group, this group. Of course, we also know that things keep changing every, so who knows what's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna, who's on the interdepartmental working group might decide to run for office in Cambridge or something like that, I don't know. I see Nishalia Porter, if you wanna ask your question. Hi, um, yeah, it's Michelle Porter. I'm from the Charles River Watershed Association. Um, I'm sorry if you already went over this. I My internet went out, um, but I was just wondering where is the opportunity for the average resident to be engaged in the process, um, especially because the equity council has already been solidified and it seems like the collaborating partners is more if you're affiliated with an organization. So I just wanna know the level of opportunity for the local residents to be engaged in the process. Yes, thank you for asking that, Michelle. I really appreciate that. Um, so anybody can apply to be a collaborating partner. You don't have to be affiliated with an organization. So please share that information with anybody that you know who's passionate about trees uh, or the relationship to trees and either environmental issues or community well-being or health or, or whatever. Um, so anybody can be a part of that. Uh, we also will be, so this is another way that we're gonna be doing things a little bit differently. Um, typically, you know, you, what, what typically happens is the, the consultant will do things like um, open houses, right? So some of you who are, I, I see there was a reference to the Milkley Park redesign, right? So Stoss has been involved in that. Um, and they did these massive like week long uh, activities at Milkley to get the public thinking about, and the public that goes to Milkley Park, thinking about how that park could be used differently. What we will be doing is uh, partly because of COVID and despite what some people think, we are still in the middle of a pandemic, at least my community is still in the middle of a pandemic. So we wanna do things in a, in a COVID safe manner um, until this gets a little bit more better control. So we will be going to where people are. So if there are uh, neighborhood groups and, and to us, you don't have to be a civic association necessarily or connected to a community-based organization. If you are part of a, you know, a local group of parents that get together uh, you know, at your local tot lot or whatever, and you wanna bring some folks together to hear more about this, we are open to trying to schedule that with you. Uh, so we want to broaden this out as, as, as much as we can outside of the standard you know, spaces and places where that happens. We will also be doing uh, things, and I, it should be released today, I think. We will also be doing some social media related ac uh, engagement activities. So if, if we don't see it, hopefully it comes out. Um, we are starting what we're calling a photo voice project. So we're asking people to just basically submit to us either via social, I believe it's via social media or via an email address, pictures of trees that have meaning to them and tell us why, or, you know, take a picture of a place, a photo of a place that you say, you know, we really need trees here. Or I could also see maybe uh, Heidi and, and her neighbors going to uh, McConnell Park and sharing pictures of the trees that have been felled and what that means to them. Right, because we want to be able to capture all of that uh, as well and, and incorporate the, this history, both historically. I live in East Boston. You know, there's pictures of Wood Island Park being destroyed, right? So we have those pictures, um, as well as the contemporary experience that people are having and their, and their connections with trees. Trees also have, for some groups of people, uh, certain spiritual practices are very closely connected to trees. 
And these are things that we also want to know about because we also want to incorporate that into the way that we think about how do we shape a plan that is equitable, right? Uh, so we will be doing things like that as part of our outreach. And if you have specific people that you would like us to reach out to, or you have ideas about how to do that, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, Natalie has my contact information um, to me or to Amy and Davi or to Rachel and Jenny, because, you know, we want to know um, who wants to talk to us. Uh, and the question in the chat about where will the photos of the tree be sent? I believe that it there it has it's supposed to be out on social media right now, but I haven't seen it yet because I've only had one cup of coffee today. Um, that we will be collecting it, I think, via social media and or email. But I'll, I, I can definitely get back to you on on the actual process. Um, how we're actually going to be doing that. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, I can make sure that Natalie has that information so that she can share it with you. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll make sure to get that information out. Mm -hmm. So we have just a few minutes left, so we won't get to the last thing on our agenda, but that was okay. We can push that off. Um, and yeah, I just want to make sure before, I'm sorry, Natalie, Michelle, no, does that answer your question? It may not have, and that, if, that's, if that's the case, do not hesitate to reach out to me. No, yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, we have a few minutes left. So if anyone does have any last questions, we'd love to hear them. I don't see anyone else raising their hand. So if you do think of questions after this meeting, I'll make sure to share out Nina's contact information and you can always contact her. Oh, David, do you have something? I, I, I just wanted to say hi. I, my daughter just graduated eighth grade. Uh, so um, I couldn't join today, but thank you, Nina, for, for, uh, for joining. And I'm looking forward to seeing the recording. Um, I also wanted to share with everyone in case it, maybe it was it was mentioned. I don't know if Bill mentioned it, but the, the Adopt a Tree program uh, is going to be something we're pushing out next week. Um, so stay tuned for a little more on that. Nina, I, I will share that with your team too. Um, it's been a long time in coming. Yeah, but I don't know if there's something else you want to add to that. You're muted. Okay, sorry. Uh, no, no more than as David said, uh, rolling it out next week in collaboration with actually Boston Parks and Recreation. So we've worked closely with the department as well as Speak for the Trees. It's uh, electronically based, it'll be online. Hang tags will be hung from each one of the new trees that have been planted over the past three years in East Boston in the Ellis neighborhood in the South End. So. It really will be, I believe, we believe a model for the rest of the city for any other neighborhood that might want to jump on board. It's going to be pretty seamless for somebody to be able to do that and um, keep these young trees alive. That's it. Thanks for the update, David and Bill, on that. And we'll keep you all updated as that continues to unfold throughout the summer. And yeah, I just want to say a huge thank you to Nina to coming to this meeting and answering questions. And I know it, it means a lot to everyone to be able to speak with you and have a dialogue with you about these issues. So I appreciate that. And before we end, I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about that last agenda item that we had that we couldn't get to that we can talk about more next meeting, which is writing a letter to the mayoral candidates about what we want to see with regards to urban forestry. I know that if you've watched the past couple mayoral forums on climate or climate justice, there's been a few um, trees have been brought up a lot and the candidates continue to say that they're important and they love trees, but there hasn't been a whole lot of substance with regards to what they're going to do and their policies will be. And so we were thinking that we could get together a group or speak for the trees can help write a letter to the candidates to say, this is what 
we, the community in Boston, want with regards to urban forestry. So we want to have a bigger dialogue on that. And so I'll keep this in the notes as well. But if you want to start thinking about what you want to see, we can have a bigger discussion next month about that. So with that, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining and everyone for your great questions. And I hope to continue to keep these conversations going. And thank you, Nina. Thank you. Stay warm, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you.